Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a returning subscriber, hello, Bestie. I hope you're having an amazing day. You see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts? You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So absolute no-brainer to crush that subscribe button. We are here today with a very special guest for our very special 100th episode, the one and only Sharon Watkins. How are you, Sharon? Oh, good. Thank y'all for having me. I'm quite honored to be on your 100th episode. Well, thank you. Yeah, everyone talks about this podcast because this is the highest rated uh, ethics and compliance podcast in the world. Global. And globally. <laughs> and uh, we're super excited to get you on. So you first came on my radar when I was in undergrad, majoring in accounting and finance, when the whole Enron scandal uh, collapsed, or when you, you know, when you speaking up and you showing that courage brought down one of the really, really, you know, a golden child of uh of the economy so super excited to get you on our paths are are converging uh here we 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 help a lot of ethics and compliance professionals uh, we talk to a lot of whistleblowers and so you know who better for the 100th episode than the one and only sharon watkins thank you so We're glad you're here sharon it's an honor to have you so let's just kind of dive in and jump in for people who've been living under a rock or people who are in the uh, millennia or the uh, the Gen Z generation. Why don't we start with your story, how you kind of came to uh, how your name came to be in the headlines and what that path was like uh, through that that company? Well, sure. I had uh, been at Enron about eight years and. Frauds are quite often discovered when people switch positions. You're kind of like the, the person walking in the room saying, hey, what's this elephant in the room? And everyone else has been trying to put up blinders and not, not see that elephant. And I, I switched jobs, stumbled across horrible fraud. And I will say that they, Enron used a lot of complexity in their accounting shenanigans. And I quite often use the emperor's new clothes as an analogy about it. Mm -hmm. You know, where you've got an emperor focused on clothes and not running his kingdom. And that really was Ken Lay, our chairman and CEO. He was focused more on politics, on, you know, the outward image of, mm -hmm. of trying to bring ga gas fired power to developing countries. You know, that's a little cleaner than coal or other things, just focused on the outward Im image. Swindlers in that tale, I consider to be Jeff Skilling and Andy Fastow. Jeff Skilling was our chief operating officer and Andy Fastow was our chief financial officer. Yep. So I considered them the, the swindlers. But um, in that fable, you know, you can't see the cloth if you're either stupid or not fit for your office. Mm -hmm. You know, so sort of some intimidation around this. Uh -huh. And that's kind of the way Enron operated. Um, Jeff Skilling used to have a famous saying of, um, hey, um, you know, that person isn't smart enough to get it, you know, if you're asking too many questions. You know, the person we've hired the smartest finance minds in the country, the smartest accounting minds, legal minds, you know, you're going to keep asking questions and sh show you're too stupid to get it. Um, so what happened was I stumbled across this fraud, was dusting off my resume. I just was like, I've got to get out of here. And within literally two weeks after finding this fraud, Jeff Skilling quit the company. So I felt like, wow, you know, that's probably, you know, I probably know a deeper reason why he's leaving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let me, let me go speak with Ken Lay, chairman of the chairman of the board. He's stepping back in a CEO. He hasn't been paying attention to the details. I thought Skilling's resignation gave me credibility. Like maybe now, you know, you can believe this horrible thing I'm telling you because why else would someone like Jeff Skilling, leave their dream job. He'd been at the company for 10 years. He finally got the CEO spot January 2001. And eight months later, he's quitting. Right. So what was that like? What was the reaction you got like? And uh, how surprising was that for you? Well, it, it was a, I, I was really waking up two o'clock in the morning, unable to go back to sleep, rehearsing in my mind, you know, what could I tell Ken Lay to let him realize that Arthur Anderson, this very well-respected auditing firm, had really prostituted themselves? You know, it's hard to hard to believe a firm would would let. First off, you're really saying Enron's committed accounting fraud, yep. but also Arthur Anderson has allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I thought I had the right memos, the right spreadsheets, but 
what was crazy about it, I had about 30 minutes with him and he was listening and acting like, okay, he's taking me seriously. But near the end, he said, well, you think Andy Fastow is doing a good job, right? The CFO, he's doing a good job. And I was just dumbfounded. You know, I'm sitting here telling you that your CFO has helped cook the books. <laughs> How can I possibly agree with you that he's doing a good job? Wow. What a mind boggling response. Yes. Yeah. I just want to make sure that you think he's, he's so, so what you're saying is he's a good cook. <laughs> he's great at teams. <laughs> yeah. So, he's, he's managed to fool a lot of people. Yeah. Hmm. I guess, I mean, I guess he's good at something. So, um, leading up to that, Sharon, like, how quickly were you convinced of what you were sitting on? Because I imagine there are all of these people who had a sniff of this, knew that mm -hmm. it st that it was stinky, you know, turned a blind eye, just said, ah, you know, I'm sure someone else is checking that. Oh, we get an audit. So, you know, Arthur Anderson probably would have caught that. I may be misinterpreting it. What was your path to going from like, whoa, what's going on here to like, I'm almost completely certain that there's a massive problem here. Well, it there's sort of a twofold answer to that question. First off, I started my career at Arthur Anderson and worked to being up to an experienced manager. I worked in both the Houston and New York offices. And that eighth year, when you're getting close to knocking on the door to make a partner, they told all of us experienced managers that the number one criteria for you to make partner is if we took away your book of business, you know, all your auditing clients, you could rebuild that book of business in one year. Wow. Wow. So they're saying salesmanship, you know, is more important than technical proficiency or your commitment to auditing standards and accounting principles. Right. So, and then, so I knew Anderson had lost its way. And then additionally, um, I had seen them sign off on some things in 96 that I thought were inappropriate. Mm. But when I started meeting with people concerned with these Raptor structures that I'd stumbled across, the answers were, you know, once again, it's very complex, mm -hmm. lots of boxes on a whiteboard, but the Raptors were supposed to be outside entities and they owed Enron about $500 million. And the people explaining the structures said, well, the Raptors are going to pay Enron back by accessing and getting their hands on some Enron stock that's kind of in these structures, selling it in the marketplace and paying Enron back. And oh, the stock isn't worth 500 million anymore, it's worth about 200, so there's a hole here, a $300 million hole. And I didn't hear where there was any outside money involved, like who lost money? Yeah. Enron's lost money, we haven't reported it in our financial statements, but the way we're covering that loss is you know, more in more Enron stock, selling Enron stock in the marketplace. Who's the third party that that lost money? And people trying to explain it to me finally would just give up and say, "Hey, we're not accountants. Arthur Anderson's blasted. It must mm -hmm. be okay." Okay, right? Yeah, because that was kind of my follow up question to that. It seems like you you know we talk within our company about this value of common sense, right? You don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to kind of figure out like, hey, you know, at some point this is a closed system, so it's gotta go somewhere. It seems like you had that common sense, but you know, I think my question is, C.S. Lewis has this idea of the inner ring, of there are people very close to something that know exactly what's going on, and then there are all these concentric circles of someone's kind of in on it, or you know, someone kind of has some blinders. What do you think was the range, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just maybe lead it here. I imagine not every employee at Enron other than you was completely in on it and had signed off on it. But what do you think is that mix of the people around you? I think you mentioned some people just saying, hey, we're not accountants. But, you know, how does something this, this big happen? And where do you think kind of people around you could have noticed it or been brave enough to speak up and they didn't? Well, and I think those are great points. That inner ring, the people that really knew that it was wrong, I'd say it was not even a half a dozen people. Wow. Um, ben Glisson was a, an accountant um, hired out of the industry, accounting industry, to work at Enron for Andy Fastow. And he helped structure some of these things. And he was one of the first to plead guilty. Hmm. You know, he just, he, like, I know this is bad. They're going to eventually find out it's bad. So I'm just going to be first in line and get the best deal. Okay. Um, I, I just think not too many people were really understanding it. And it falls into that. 
um, arena of just, this isn't my role, I don't quite understand it. But your point that none of this is that complex. Yep. Yeah, and right. if, if, if you can't explain it to a first grader, um, or if you're on the other side of the table and someone's trying to explain it to you, if they can't explain it, either they don't understand it or it's intentionally opaque, it's intentionally complex. Right. They are trying to just wear you down to where you just give up and, and do that diffusion of responsibility excuse. Well, Anderson's blessed it, it must be okay. Wow. Um, so I think, and the, the reason that ladder problem existed is Enron had a rank and yank review system. You were, it was pretty brutal. You were evaluated twice a year. What have you done for Enron lately? So people that were not in the accounting department would just say, hey, you know, I'm not getting good answers. I don't feel good in my gut about this, but I'm not in the accounting department. It's not my job. What have I done for Enron lately? I got to go focus on my next deals. Right. Yeah. And um, you need a certain confidence interval or a certain courage to step out or step into something that's sort of outside of your realm. I mean, at the end of the day, I think people are most concerned about themselves, their personal safety or whatever, which can obviously translate into keeping their, you know, keeping their mortgage paid and keeping their kids fed and yes. stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it becomes kind of easy, especially on something that's intentionally opaque to your point um, for them to say, you know what, I can't really spend a lot of more calories on this. It's not even my area. Again, we have, you know, one of the big five at that time you know, blessing the thing. So, you know, kind of move on, keep your job and don't fall to, at the bottom of that rank and yank uh, hierarchy. You know what I mean? Exactly. But, you know, then the problem becomes, you know, the Department of Justice has over two dozen felons associated with Enron. Wow. And, you know, only, mm -hmm. only a handful are the perpetrators of the fraud. The rest are sort of unwilling participants. Mm -hmm. You know, those people that weren't getting good answers, but just said, hey, it's not my job. Additionally, there's a whole host that had to pay hefty legal fees trying to make sure they weren't indicted. Yeah. So there was quite a cost to going along. Yeah, and it's a cost that people don't think they're going to have to uh, bear is the point. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a bet being made at, at all times, right? You're making a bet on, hey, you know, I'm not going to get in a bad spot from, you know, not speaking up or, you know, whatever whatever the expected value of this sort of uh, game is, uh, so to speak. And boy, that can really go left when you're sitting there uh, in the courtroom racking up, you know, there's $10,000 per hour, probably more, when you look at your legal team sitting next to you with the legal pads. Uh, it's very fragile and it can fall apart very quickly. And again, like I was, I'm just fascinated by the Enron thing because it was like my first picture of, uh, you know, this thing that glitters is not actually gold, you know, as I'm sort of learning about business and stuff like that. Um, and it's, uh, recently a couple of things have been popping up on some like social feeds of like this Forbes picture, this Forbes cover of like, you know, America's best companies and it's Enron and it's got the CEO on it. And it's like, boy, this did not age that well. But again, from the surface, you don't know what's going on inside the company. Just like you don't know what's going on in somebody's house. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't, you don't know what's happening behind those four walls. And you can't tell from looking at that glossy cover, the type of incentives that leadership is sort of in imposing on the organization either explicitly or implicitly by some of these tactics that that we're talking about i find it super interesting though that you go to the chairman and it again i don't know like these guys very detailed but it doesn't sound like the chairman had a different that different of a view than the ceo you know what i'm saying like the same tactics were kind of employed against you maybe a different flavor of them to kind of stiff arm you to kind of shut you up and so forth. So it's like that tone from the top has such a massive impact on the lives and how people live out those lives throughout the organization. Oh, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I back to the emperor's new clothes, I had Jeff McMahon, a former treasurer, encouraging me to meet with Lay. You know, I had met with him and he told me some additional information. He said, I'll put a call in. I'll tell him you're, you're, you've got credible concerns and he should listen to you. Um, you know, I was, I was encouraged to go meet with, with Ken Lang. And all this is between, you know, Jeff Skilling leaving and a week later when I'm on Ken Lay's calendar. Yeah. And it's almost like I am meeting with Ken Lay saying, you're the emperor, you know, you're being swindled, you've got on no clothes. And Ken Lay could have turned to the executives right underneath them and said, you know, could she be right? Are we exposed? Have we cooked the books? But I think instead he turned to the executives around him and said, hey, you know, we're paying Anderson 
$52 million a year to audit us, $1 million a week. I better be clothed, you know, for that amount of money. Yeah. And they were like, Hey, you know, you're, you're, I'm sure you are. Anderson's the clothing expert, not me. Mm -hmm. Um, So he sent out the vibe that what Sharon Watkins is telling me better not be true. Right. So I think people were ready and willing to kind of back me up, but then they read the tea leaves and back down. Yeah. And I think it, you know, gets to core values that are so important to this, right? Like there are all these layers of how you impact Uh, a situation like this, right? It can be policies, it can be audits, it can be enforcement, it can be culture. But, you know, I think within that answer is an expression of this value of she better not be right. Just like you were talking about that at Anderson, it was like, you better get billings and you better be able to bring in revenue Mm -hmm. because that is the value that's going to win the day. Um, And, you know, I think that you saw that expressed in that answer, right? Where he's like, not, you know, the, the value is not integrity or truth or, hey, let's make sure that like we come clean if we mess something up. The value is, hey, someone better uh, protect me, which we kind of talk about as like compliance 1.0 of compliance and ethics. You know, <laughs> like we talk about it being in the 90s. Totally. The ni- com- 90s compliance and ethics was keep the boss out of jail. And it's progressed a lot past that. <laughs> but that's the, like, that's like the epitome of this thing of like, hey, I better be protected here. I know, I know. And, you know, on the whole ethics front, it seems like there's great tools to do employee surveys, you know, to figure out really what's going on underneath the surface. Yep. But too many companies don't even want to know. Right. You know, they don't employ these rather simplistic, not not very expensive tools. Keep the lie alive is maybe what mm-hmm. some companies should put on their value statement. You know, they want to keep the lie alive. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to know. And, um it really makes it hard for whistleblowers and we've had some other whistleblowers on the podcast and we've had some chats with those folks and many of them have said, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into, but if I had the opportunity to do it again, I probably would still do the same thing. How do you feel about that decision that you made? Well, it's, it's very ironic that Enron's core values were respect, integrity, communication, and excellence. And on that communication value, the little notepads and desk toys that we would have um, was a Martin Luther King Jr. quote that our lives begin to end the day we remain silent about things that really matter. Wow. And so unpacking that quote, you know, what do you mean your lives begin to end? Um, And what he really means is, you know, your soul is eroding. Yeah, right. Your ability to think highly of yourself you know, and what you stand for and what your purpose is, you know, sort of erodes. And I've seen that with some of my Enron colleagues. Um, The ones that, you know, were not the ones, some of the ones that mentally are healthier are the ones that pled guilty and went to prison for a couple of years because they've kind of come to terms with their role in Enron's fraud. But the ones that weren't indicted kind of fought it. They're now coming out on, the excuse that the government was abusive or, you know, made, mm. made a mountain out of a mohill. They're, they're having to rationalize how they weren't involved in something bad. And that rationalization, I think, erodes your soul, you know, causes, causes stress and everything else. Um, it's, it, it's, um, I think it's, it's more, for me, I would do things a little more differently, but I think when an ethical challenge lands on your lap, you can't compare your life to what it was before the ethical challenge. Mm. You know, it will never be that way again. A challenge is landed on your lap and it's best to be fearless, to address it, to speak up and try to get it corrected because that's the path where you're, um, you're going to be most proud of yourself versus trying to cover up or ignore it. Wow. I really love the way that you talk about that, Sharon, because, you know, I think a lot of times when people talk about this or when people consider it, the the distinction is, well, what is going to cost me if I speak up and how does that compare to what my life is going to be if, mm-hmm. if I don't? And it's thought of like, well, hey, I had to deal with all of this, you know, people slinging mud at me and I was, you know, kind of blackballed from the industry or whatever it is. Look at the cost of speaking up. But I love that you've highlighted the cost of not saying something is that erosion of your soul, that that it's that that rationalization that you bring up m- means that you have to carry around all this dissonance all the, all the right. time of 
I'm, you know what, I'm a good person. You know what, I, I do do the right thing. You know, this, it just wasn't that clear this time, and you always have to do those mental gymnastics, and you have to carry that around all the time. So I love that you drew that distinction of the cost that you bear for not speaking up. Um, because I think a lot of times people focus on, well, look at all the stuff you have to deal with if you lose your job and, you know, people are accusing you of this or, or stuff like that. But that cost on the other, that other side is big. And I, I love the way you speak about it. And that, wow. that, that cost of rationalization to your point, it like takes soul energy to keep that flywheel of rationalization going. And at some point you're just a liar because you're just lying to yourself. Yeah. You right. what you say to yourself. Right. And, you know, in terms, there's two examples of that within Enron because, you know, Cliff Baxter did not like what was happening. Mm -hmm. He was the he head of mergers and acquisitions at Enron. He resigned in May of 2001 because he complained about Enron doing business with the CFO's investment partnership. It got nowhere. He resigned. He and he's the one that killed himself. You know, in his suicide oh, yeah. note said, "Where well, there was once great pride, now there is none." But he was actually one of the good guys. But did he beat himself up because he he? didn't go to the press or didn't go to the SEC Interesting. after he left the company. But to his, to his, in his defense in 2001, there really weren't good mechanisms for that. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of the SEC didn't have their office of the whistleblower and things like that. Which is mind boggling Ray, in and of itself, by the way. I know. And Ray Bowen um, was in, was in the treasury finance world. He had to settle with the SEC, neither confirming nor denying wrongdoing. He was banned from being a public company officer for five years, had to pay a fine. He was just getting out of that five-year ban, mm -hmm. and he died of a heart attack in his 50s. Wow. You know, so there's a cost of, of doing the wrong thing or not speaking up. Um, so it's, it's really alarming. But on the flip side, the, you know, if you turn around the Martin Luther King Jr. quote, you know, you can say that your life begins to soar the day you speak out about things that really matter. Wow. And for me, um, you mentioned C.S. Lewis, you know, there's a parable of the talents, you know, you're this wealthy master leaves some, some talents with his servants heads out. He comes back later. What'd you do with them? There's two servants that took a risk with the talents and doubled what they'd been given. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the message to them is come and share the master's happiness. Mm -hmm. And the third one that just buried it and didn't do anything with it, it's not so good what's said to him. So that's that's sort of a, you know, almost a mantra for life. Take a risk with the talent you've been given. Speak up when it matters the most. And spiritually, some amazing things happen for you. And I think that that's certainly been the case for me. And I think it's been the case for other people that have taken, taken a risk. You know, you end up. I think you do have to be attuned to it, but I've really had some miraculous, cool, mystical things happen as a result. Wow. You know, all the money that you get from compromising these values, that can buy you a really nice bed, but that can't buy you a good night's sleep. And so right. what's the price on that? You know, the guy dies at, at 50. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, stress had to be a factor there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I got a good question for you, if I do say so myself. Um, <laughs> So whistleblowers, are they born or made? Um, I think a little bit of both. I, um, I am just having a discussion with some other whistleblowing organizations about kind of it takes a village. You know, Time Magazine put uh, the three of us on their cover yeah. in, the, in 2000, Cynthia Cooper from WorldCom, Colleen Raleigh from the FBI. And of course, we're all three women. Um, but we're also all three firstborn, primary breadwinners for our family, people of faith. But also, we, we, the three of us grew up in small towns of less than 10,000, mm. where it's kind of, it, I think that made us optimistic that our actions matter. You know, you're a small child, you hear your relatives talking about, hey, did you see somebody dump trash in the vacant lot off Main Street? Call mm -hmm. the mayor. You know, there's sort of a sense that, that you, you can impact the health of your village. But on the flip side, you also can get caught doing something wrong. And I mentioned that in, a, in an upcoming article for Whistleblower Network News, that when I was young, I wanted um, um, ice cream sandwiches. And my mother said, nope, nope, we're not getting that. And I went to the freezer section, opened up the ice cream sandwiches box, took a few bites of one, put it all back at a neighbor's spot. 
you know, so she told my mother, she had to buy the box, I got in trouble. But they're sort of wrapped up in that, you know, the embarrassment and shame that you brought on your family, Mm -hmm. you know, that the neighbor saw you doing something so wrong that you shouldn't have done. And does that scare you into a, I'm going to stay on the straight and narrow path? Mm -hmm. And I had this conversation with my boss when I lived in New York, and he had a similar experience. He had been hired um, as a grounds crew person at Newark. His dad knew somebody. He was like 15, 16, got his first job. And the um, experienced grounds crew people told him how they take naps in between the runways Um, and just, you know, kind of don't do their work, take some naps. So he did it. He obviously didn't know which runways to choose from and which hour to take a nap. And some pilot saw his body, you know, as he was landing. So needless to say, he gets fired. His dad's embarrassed. And he attributed that childhood transgression with kind of scaring him straight uh-huh. you know so so i think you you're a little bit born with you know some idea of right and wrong but i think those childhood endeavors where it's not your parents catching you it's someone else catching you and you kind of feel like you brought shame on the family mm-hmm. that that helps um create whistleblowers yeah or at it, least people who are dedicated to straight path Mm-hmm. Yeah, it kind of puts that seed in you, and you've seen that iterate a couple of times on this smaller chessboard. And when you get into this broader one, those same principles translate into these new dynamics and these new people, and you know, uh, more complexity and so forth. Yeah, um, I think it's really cool that you brought up the the dynamic of that small town, Sharon, because there's something that I think we're losing a little bit as the world mm-hmm. progresses the way that it does. The average company size is bigger the reach of the, you know, what you can do through the internet and where your customers are, like everything's kind of dispersing and that kind of small town feel of, you know, the butcher and, you know, you know, who runs the corner store Mm -hmm. and, you know, your families have been together for three generations or whatever, that some of that is lost. And there's something about that type of culture where I belong to a community. The things that I do matter. The way that I behave is not just it, what hangs in the balance is not just whether I get in trouble for it or not. And that kind of tight calculus of, Hey, is it worth it, you know, to speak up for this, but there are a bunch of other people who are going to be impacted positively or negatively by the things that I do. And I think that if you live in too dispersed of a culture, you know, you grew up in a massive city where you never saw anybody again, you know, you, you pass people on the street and you never see them again. Um, I think that's something that corporate leaders, would do well to foster and say, hey, you know what? This is our tribe. Hey, these are the people who matter, the, you know, whether it's our customers or our community or our employees or whatever it is, that can get some more of this integrity, right? Like integrity is these things all match up together, right? This stuff is all tightly intertwined. Um, and I think that when when you, when you it becomes too transactional, yeah. it really becomes too much every man for mm-hmm. himself yep. and do I have a contract that's going to force me to do this? You lose a lot of that ability for someone to just do the right thing because they know it's going to matter even if they can't draw a straight line to you know how their income is going to be different a month later. I love how you've brought that into the conversation because that sense of community is a key to ethics. Right. And I don't think that everyone always ties those together. No, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I'm a big proponent of internal audit being internal. You know, Enron outsourced their whole internal audit department to Arthur Anderson loan staff. I mean, uh, how does this look? Yeah, it looks great. All right. Glass. Yeah. 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 Double bill. Here's a check. Double bill. Um, But, you know, that, I mean, the way it works informally, you know, there's always those get togethers. This is the new class of 2022. You know, you might be going into internal audit, someone else is going into sales but they have all those new employee get togethers or even rotations. So what ends up happening are those really powerful informal lines of communication because, right. you know, David and Tom know each other really well. David ends up calling Tom and says, you know, you're an internal audit when you're coming into my department next quarter, you know, I want you to pull these five transactions to review. You didn't hear that from me. I want you to look at it. So the internal audit ends up catching a problem you know, stopping it, you know, and that kind of, that's because they're all in it together. Right. Um, you know, the guy in sales tried to get, do it the right way. Something's gone wrong. He's letting his buddy in internal audit know, I want you guys to catch us. Yeah. You know, and, and so it, it works together to keep things on the tried and true. Yeah. 
So then where do you think the idea or the ideal of loyalty comes into this discussion about whistleblowing and speak up culture and doing the right thing? Good question. Well, I mean, I, I personally think whistleblowers generally are loyal to the company, that, mm-hmm. but they want the company to be doing it the right way. They're almost looking down the road and saying, what we're doing now is wrong. Um, you know, it's going to be a rough patch, but we've got to come clean. We've got to correct this for the long-term health of the, mm-hmm. of the company. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't think they're disloyal. That's a bad rap that mm-hmm. whistleblowers get. But I will say that the Dodd-Frank Act that has this reward program for tips, referrals, complaints, um, it, it greatly increases the likelihood a company will be getting caught if they do something wrong. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that that provides an incentive for, for companies to focus on their ethics, compliance departments, their risk management, their internal audit departments, because they're just not likely to get away with it like they used to. Yeah. When you were going... I. I want to dive back. Let's go back in the way back, the way back machine. Um, <laughs> as you were meeting these people before all of this popped off, what kind of vibes were you getting? Any, any sniffs you got to it? Or was it really just sort of like bottom up, you looking at this bizarre whiteboard and not being able to get an, an answer in your analytical mind kind of saying, this kind of stinks? Was it, was it a confluence of things? Was it kind of a, mo- a mosaic that came together? Or was there a particular moment where like the light bulb went off and you're just like, you know, like your the scales fell, fell from your eyes or something. It's a little combination of both. I mean, the the the, the first meeting where you know these business unit guys were really explaining the Raptors, and there's no third party person involved. It's just Enron, Enron, Enron. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm shocked. I'm concerned. I'm dusting off my resume. And two weeks later, with Jeff Skilling quitting, you know, I write first an anonymous one page let you know memo my assistant drops it off an employee drop box because ken lay was holding this huge company-wide meeting to mm-hmm. address the shock of jeff skilling resigning um and i heard all the right things in that meeting you know i go and identify myself but it's a whole week later that i'm going to be on ken lay's calendar right and in that week i start putting out feelers to colleagues and employees co-workers that i trust and I, I got an Excel spreadsheet from one person that showed, you know, more evidence of the wrongdoing. I got a PowerPoint presentation that had been presented to the board of directors. That was another piece of information. Right. And it's like I got a dozen people kind of feeding me stuff. Yes, you know, here's more, here's more. And did you know this happened or that happened? Include this in your, in your talk with Ken Lake. You know, I meet with Jeff McMahon and he's like, yes, yes, go speak to him, go speak to him. So there feels like there's this huge amount of support. My mistake is I should have got, gotten at least three of these vice presidents or managing directors, you know, like myself to go with me. Uh, I was at the vice president level. Managing director is above that. You know, I should have gotten two or three more to go in with me. So I wasn't one lone voice, but you know, to, you know, a lot of those people dropped me in the grease afterwards when they realized Ken Lay did not want to hear what I was saying. Wow. What did that feel like? It was shocking. Well, fall of 2001 was awful. Yeah. You know, just absolutely awful because I was dropped in the grease. I didn't see Enron forming this crisis management team and 9-11 happened. Right. You know, so everything just felt very, you know, unsettled. Yeah. (laughs) That's an understatement. Yeah. So was, was that safe to say that that was one of the lowest points in your life or one of the biggest battles of your life? Um, it clearly was because it it shocked me that more people weren't stepping forward right. and really saying yes, this is wrong. Yeah, and, that's a big one. Yeah, and it it was very disappointing. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I lost a lot of respect for for people that I I had admired, you know, or at least you know liked and and respected, and um, it was just very disheartening. Yeah. And I really was a little bit shocked because I used the Titanic as an example too. You know, I'm I'm the crew person that sees we've hit an iceberg, water's pouring in, we're gonna sink. You know, lights are on, bands playing, but we're gonna sink. And so you go warn the captain, you're expecting the alarm bells to go off, business lines to be saved, hoard cash. And instead, you know, you you hear nothing. 
and you really see the people in charge kind of elbowing their way into the wheelhouse who's going to be the next captain of the ship right you know and you're like so you're you want to be the captain <laughs> of a sinking ship yeah i want to go you down know, with it, the ship yeah I, I really, my emotions were very much probably like a crew member that found it to be shocking that nobody was sounding the alarm bells. And what do you attribute that to? Like, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, you don't have just a uh, statistical split, but like how much of that do you think people were in denial? You think people, you know, kind of didn't want to let a good thing, you know, uh, you know, didn't want to let their job go. Right. You, you know, they were kind of in some plausible deniability or uh, you said diffusion of responsibility. Like, what do you think is that mix? Because I think it's a really interesting perspective. There are a bunch of people in this ethics profession who are trying to prevent things like this from happening. They give people training. They implement policies. They're trying to do their audits. There's, you know, there's a mix of different personalities and perspectives and boldness and, you know, adherence to integrity around you. Like, where do you think that line was in the people around you? Um, I think it, they had grown comfortable with Enron's past successes. Right. Um, there have been some people that have compared Enron's situation to also NASA's with the Columbia uh, shuttle um, um, loss, wow. where NASA had had foam strikes, you know, where chunks had fallen off, hit the shuttle, and it had provided, you know, it didn't cause any problems. And so the, one, the, the big foam strike that hit a vulnerable part of the left wing, there was a NASA engineer very concerned about that, but he got nowhere because there was just such a, we're fine, we're fine, that's not going to be a big deal. Mm. And he even predicted what was going to happen with that shuttle, that you know if it really did what he thought it did, it chunked off some of the heat shield upon reentry, that blasting heat was going to bore a bigger hole. They would lose all sensors from the left side of the shuttle and within seconds lose communication with the whole shuttle, which is what happened. Right. Um, and with Enron, I think there were people that just, you know, we're Enron. We'll get the right lines of credit. We'll get the right, you know, liquidity, um, you know, kind of bully our way through it. Um, the company wrote off those Raptor structures or at least they announced that they had in an earnings release statement mid-October. And it was just not something you can do accounting wise. It's right. kind of like robbing the bank. And then when the police stop you, you just say, well, here's the money. I haven't used any of it yet. You know, mm -hmm. here it is, you know, sorry, you know, you're still going to be arrested. Um, it was just something you cannot do. And so that kind of struck me that who in the world's advising Ken Lay, what lawyers, what accountants are sitting around telling him that this is the best best avenue. I mean, I thought he could form the crisis management team, face face the music, or keep the fraud going. I never thought they would try to write it off as a current period, non-recurring write-off, which literally, accounting-wise, is like trying to hand hand the stolen goods back to the police and saying, it's all there, yeah, you know, no harm, clean. no foul. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, lo I love that you bring in that issue of, you know, that hubris or something of, uh, yeah, that might be a problem, but I'm not going to get into it and we're going to be fine. It's almost like to have a broad culture of ethical conduct, there needs to be some humility right. that we are not ab above reproach. This, you know, a scandal is not something that we are completely insulated from and that would never happen to us. Um, I think that that's an interesting angle and something to try to impress upon the culture of, don't assume that like the music's never going to stop playing because, you know, it can happen to anybody. Yeah. And life is fragile and everything's fragile and everything can fall apart. So, right. I mean, Enron's not even a going concern anymore, irrespective of all the accolades they got and the golden boy of business and all those kinds of things. It's not even around anymore. It's it's no. a punchline at this point. You know what I'm saying? So everything. And Arthur Anderson's away. not around. There anymore. you go. Mm -hmm. There you yeah. go. I mean, uh, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about what those what that next sort of chapter was like so you kind of sniff this thing out you get some good in, intel some good insights you know part and as we talk about this i'd love to hear about some of the other things that you would have done differently because we're always in this sort of conflict and battle of like we want to give people a way to speak up to voice concerns you know we in our business we want to hear it all because reality is our friend and so forth there's some disconnect that happens as a company scales but as you're going through that that next chapter you talk to you talk to the uh, chairman of the board, things started moving. And then at some point you have this label as a whistleblower on you. I don't know how long 
that took, but what was that next stage of, of, of your journey like? Well, so Enron wrote off those Raptor structures in an, in an earnings call. You know, yeah. they, they actually never filed their third quarter financial statements. And the very next day, the Wall Street Journal had an expose article. They had someone giving them information. There's a whistleblower that was giving the Wall Street Journal some information. And they hit Enron with front page expose articles that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and by Friday, the SEC was conducting an investigation. Enron really went radio silent. They didn't explain themselves very well. And the stock price just spiraled further down, down, mm -hmm. down. We went from like $33 a share to nine cents by the end of November. Wow. Lots of shareholder litigation filed, you know, problem after problem. And I, uh, the company declared bankruptcy December 1st or 2nd. It was on a weekend. And on December 3rd, on Monday, you know, people are, call, you know, pulled together for big floor meetings and their managers tell them, hey, last Friday was your last paycheck. Go back to your desk, clear out your personal items and go. You know, no severance pay, no medical insurance. And I phoned up the head of HR. I, I really had no real job. So I had been working for Andy Fastow on the 49th floor, which was, you know, our, part of our executive suites. Mm -hmm. And I was moved down to HR on the 16th floor. Um, no real assignments in this limbo period of, of during the investigation, mm -hmm. quote unquote. And, um, you know, the head of HR said, Sharon, if you didn't get a call over the weekend where you were asked to stay on to work for the bankruptcy estate, you know, you're, you're yeah. gone too you know, and I had been asked by an in-house lawyer to meet with the law firms that had been hired by Enron in all these shareholder litigation. You know, so they had a law firm right. representing Enron's board, a law firm representing Enron, the corporation, a law firm representing Enron executives. And he had had me meeting with these lawyers. Now I understand that he had told them eventually you know, the plaintiff is going to find Sharon and find out what she's saying. So this is kind of like what the opposing side is saying. Yeah. You know, can you understand it? You know, so I was kind of, you know, be, being used to help defend Enron, I guess. Mm -hmm. But this in-house lawyer said, don't leave the building. You know, let me see if I can get you one more month of employment. Because, you know, if you're if you're walking out the door, you're going to be hunting for a job. And I, I really would like for you to still continue meeting with some of these law firms. So he saved my job that day for about a month. And mid-January is when Congress found all that material that I'd given Ken Lay in August mm -hmm. um, in a box of subpoenaed documents. There were about 11 congressional investigations that were looking into why, you know, a company the size of Enron had never really reported a losing quarter and yeah. poof, you know, they go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And shareholders were holding stock worth $60 billion at the beginning of 2001, you know, so in, in one year, a company goes from being worth 60 billion to nothing, you right. know, what happened? And Enron had, was not trying to hide information as much as drown Congress with too much. Mm. They said they just were receiving, you know, rooms full of boxes um, and poor, some poor congressional staffer was probably stuck in a basement, you know, just going through everything. And when they found my memos, they released it to the press. But they also did some very direct subpoenas. Like we're going to ask Vincent and Elkins, the law firm, what did you do around these allegations? Arthur Anderson, what did you do around these allegations? Enron, what did you do? So it kind of opened up the discovery process almost and that's when i was subpoenaed to testify in front of congress did that feel like some vindication for you well it was that and the most vindication came about from something known as the powers report mm -hmm. and when enron was totally falling apart our asleep at the switch board of directors finally hired an outside law firm, an outside accounting firm to investigate my concerns and to look into a few other things. And they added Bill Powers to the board and he was running this, this investigation. And Bill Powers had, was the dean of the School of Law at, at University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. 
And so this report has his name on it. It's known as the Powers Report. And they filed it early February, 2002. And that really vindicated me. It basically said everything I had claimed was true. And there's even some more rotten stuff. Mm -hmm. So that felt safer. I, I was no longer the one lone voice that was saying Enron had committed fraud. Yeah, I mean, how different would your life have been if that staffer didn't go into that archive box? I mean, have you thought about that before? Uh, um, well, yeah, it'd be very different, you know, because I, I think I would have worked at Enron maybe a month or two more, and then I would have been part of that 5,000 trying to find, you know, a, a job. Yeah, um, so you definitely took the scenic route. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Um, Walking into Congress, what was that like? I mean, it's kind of this interesting dynamic that you were kind of a part of because you, it's almost like uh, the allegiance can differ between your country and your government. And, you know, what I find is that whistleblowers, to your point, are some of the most loyal people. They're the, some of the most conscientious people. They're the most value driven people. And they're really being super loyal to this idea that of what the company is or the idea of what the company is supposed to be as stated on its values page or on its mission or something. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this, um, this sort of paradox where management is maybe pushing in a different direction due to their own self-interest or something where there's this sort of like, uh, and I think this is why a lot of, uh, whistleblowers get blackballed, which I'd love to talk about a little bit, mm -hmm. but, um, there's this interesting sort of, uh, dissonance between like the source of the loyalty and sometimes you think you're working t you know you're trying to be loyal to the company when actually someone is sort of taking advantage of you and I think we saw an example of that as you were kind of brought in to help kind of build the defense um, when it became clear to you uh, that okay hey you know there's kind of nothing to save you know there's no way to save this sinking Titanic and then you're brought into Congress. What was that like walking in there? And as you look down down the path where you're like, okay, I'm kind of in the grease now. These guys pushed me in the grease. What were those feelings like when you're like, how do I get up out of this thing and kind of land back on my feet? Well, it's, it's interesting because they Congress did subpoena Ken Lay, um, our risk management person, R Richard By, Rick Causey, our chief accounting officer, Andy Fastow. And they all pled the fifth, you know, I'm, I, you know, they went there, they held up their hand to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But when asked questions, you know, they said, I'm pleading the fifth, fifth amendment. Yeah. Jeff Skilling did testify. He was the only, you know, one of the only few executives, but, but a few others did too. The lawyers testified, Jeff McMahon testified. And what I found in, in watching and paying attention to their congressional testimony is they sure did, they sure had trouble recalling a lot of things. Uh -huh. You know, I just don't recall that. Or yes, I know I wrote that down, but you know, that was four years ago or two years ago. And for me, when, when I was called to testify, you know, you're sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so I, I kind of felt like I sure don't want to lie. Yeah. You know, if there's truth that I know I'm supposed to tell the whole truth. So it was a lot of testimony really pointing out where the problems were. It kind of helped mark the prosecutional trail on where Enron had problems. And at that point, you know, Enron was already bankrupt. You're really wanting the truth to come out. So the guilty people might be held to account, but that there might be some lessons learned from it. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I want to kind of dive into the label and, you know, you know, very few whistleblowers that we've spoken to would say, I wouldn't do it again because they're just those kinds of people. Mm -hmm. um, but how difficult was your life after you stood on your principles and how long did it take for whatever negative uh, label or whatever uh, that was attached to you for oddly, paradoxically doing the right thing to kind of fall off? You know what I mean? Um, that's a great question. I am... Um I mean, it, it, I'm the only whistleblower that has a great story. You know, all that congressional testimony, um, you know, time put us on their cover. I, I, I had immediate speaking requests, you know, all over the country. And, you know, I've been to some fantastic places around the globe talking about leadership and ethics. So I have a very good story. 
you know, able to make a living on the lecture circuit. But as I sought out corporate employment, those doors would be shut. And even um, I used to live two blocks from Rice University and looked at participating in some of their executive sessions and their executive training. And it looked like it was a big, wide open door of opportunity um, until, it, until that door was slammed shut. So I think it's taken almost 20 years for the full troublemaker aspect of it to wash off. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm now the executive in resident at, at residence at Texas State University first full-time job in 20 years. Wow. Um, so that's a long time, you know, for that label to be, to be washed off. And do, you, um, do you think that was a, a function of the time? Do you think that was the function of the era that we were in? Or do you feel like if, you know, hey, Dodd-Frank's in place now, if you were kind of, you know, if it was happening now, do you feel like the world is sort of more, um, I don't know, like responsive to this? Like, or do you still think like if that happened today, it would be 2042 before that label fell off? You know what I'm, you know what I'm asking here? Yes, I do. Um, well, the beauty of Dodd-Frank is it does allow a would-be whistleblower to contact a lawyer and remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. And the SEC really works with that lawyer to try to make sure that their investigation and their inquiries within the company don't pinpoint who likely, you know, told them about the problems. So it would be great. They get a reward and they can hopefully stay employed at their company and their company starts doing the right thing. But to me, it's always been kind of hard to understand yeah. why. But I spoke at a conference in 2003 at the Aspen Institute and I met um, Bob Monk and he and Nell Minow started Institutional Shareholder Services. They're in this kind of corporate governance leadership space. And this was a reception cocktail conversation, but he said, you know, you and Cynthia Cooper, you know, she's from WorldCom, you guys will never work in corporate America again. And I'm like, what? You know, particularly Cynthia Cooper, who was head of internal audit and did everything the right way. You know, what do you mean we're not going to work in, in, our, in corporate America again? And she said, he said, eh, people just see you walking down the hall and you make them feel bad. You know, something deep down in their subconscious says they, they probably wouldn't have had the courage to speak up like you did. Mm. So you just make them feel bad and they can find that skill set somewhere else. Wow. You know, wow. and How so crazy. maybe that's it. But maybe, maybe that that's it. it. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, it, it really, it doesn't make sense to me that, you know, there's some psychology there of like, I feel guilty. I'm not as righteous as you, you know, uh, Hey, you know, let's get somewhere. Let's get someone else. I kind of feel weird. Maybe that explains it. You know, I think a lot of people in our market, you know, people who are ethics experts, compliance leaders who work in governance and audit and all of that, you know, I, I think they see this the right way and they see, Hey, you know what? Oh, I'd no, love I, to have... I, can, oh, go ahead. I completely agree with that. I mean, I think people that are in this space. Yeah would love to have me, love to have Cynthia Cooper. Uh, and I also think 90% of the people within an organization are, are very, would be very excited okay. to have a whistleblower. But it's that, just that one person in leadership yeah. that just nixes it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just that one or two person, person in the organization that's near the top that just says, eh, do we really know what their motivations were? You know, can't we get this skill set elsewhere? There's just too much baggage here. It, I think mm -hmm. most of the people in the organization would be happy to have us. It's just that one or two, and they happen to be powerful enough to squash it. Yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective because I think a lot of people in our space who are ethics experts say, hey, you know what, I'd love that. And if it's so hard for whistleblowers to get hired, I guess everyone else is against us. And we're just kind of way on the other side of this line of integrity. And I think you illustrate it well, Sharon, that you know, there are a bunch of people who would be for it, but there's some politics and there's some power structures and, you know, there's some of that old boys club of, hey, you know what, let's just not mess with this, um, which is really unfortunate and maybe it's changing and maybe the culture is changing. But it, you know, I think part of the challenge with this whole whistleblower conversation and, you know, the really the travesty that you haven't yeah. had a full time job for the past 20 years because of this is it there's this tyranny of the minority that it does not have to be a majority decision to not employ a whistleblower. One or two or a handful of people can scuttle that whole thing. And then it's like, all right, start the recruiting process over again. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. It, and, you know, uh, as an executive, I think I can say this, but there's an oversampling of sociopaths at the executive level. So what? The odd, <laughs> <laughs> so the odds of someone being like put off by somebody who's quote unquote more righteous is just going to be higher. And again, there's more power concentrated there. Um, it's just this bizarre paradox because some of our best teammates are people that have been whistleblowers in other places. And we're definitely uh, proponents of you know, hiring whistleblowers and trying to like erase this stigma because I don't know, it's, you know, you know, I guess unless you're trying to hide stuff, you don't want these people around or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the natural assumption is like, oh, well, I guess if I can't get hired here, they must be trying to hide something. They must be unethical. Um, or I just imagine that some people, you know, I've wondered that myself, like, how can nobody want Sharon Watkins to work work for you? Right. You know she's going to be honest. <laughs> you know she's going to stand up for the right thing. You know, you know it's not going to be a fox watching the hen house. Um, but I've wondered that same thing. Like, okay, well, do they have something to hide, or you know, they just you know don't want to get in the fray? But I think that dynamic of it can just be a couple people who are uncomfortable, or someone who mm -hmm. you know casts you know some vague aspersions on your character and says, ah, well, maybe you know, you know, maybe she's just bitter and she wanted to take them down or something like that. Um, it doesn't take a lot to kind of mess this up. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been a really fun conversation. Um, I don't know. I've, uh, like I said, I saw you when you were t testifying to Congress and I was like, wow, this is freaking amazing. Look at the courage that this person yeah. um, is exhibiting. And again, you're kind of jump, you kind of jump off the cliff and you don't know, you don't know where you're going to land. You don't know how long this label, you know, how, how you don't, you don't know the implications of it is, is, is my point. So it's great to talk to you. It's great to pick your brain. Uh, I feel like we could. this could be like a three-hour episode, but it's been a lot of fun to hear your insights. Um, as we part ways, I, I have two questions for you. One is, if you go back in time to Sharon, before, you know, you talked about it a little bit, but go back before that, um, you know, to a young Sharon who's maybe just coming out of undergrad or something, what advice would you give yourself? And then separately, what advice would you give somebody who's witnessing some kind of malfeasance in their company, but is a little bit scared to speak up and speak out uh, about it? Okay, great questions. Um, well, I do tell college students, um, you know, see why people are excited to work at, at an organization. You know, what does the CEO say? You know, you're really looking for leadership that, that really loves the products and services that they're producing. You know, they're, they're really, um, what they talk about, you know, is their employees, their customers, their products. I mean, you can think about Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, he was always talking about, you know, the iPod music that, or the latest Mac. Um, it was always about the products. And Jeff Skilling was always talking about our stock price. Uh -huh. And I think also if people were to say, oh, why do you work here? You know, you're interviewing for a job at Enron, you know, why do you work here? Well, at Enron International, people would say, you know, it's very, very inspiring and kind of fulfilling to go into a developing country that lacks reliable electricity and help, yeah. you know, build electric plants, you know, where people now have, you know, water wells that run or, mm -hmm. or comfort, the creature comforts that we just take for granted. Yeah. Um, if you ask some of the traders or some of the people that were in the, in the areas under Jeff Skilling, you'd hear more about you're going you're to make more money here than exactly. you ever thought you'd make. You know, it's all about what what you were going to be taking right. home. Um, so the wrong motivations. And, you know, so you're really what motivates you to work here is a great question when you're interviewing, you know, at, at companies, you know, what 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 makes the makes them excited to come to work. And if it's all about stock price and personal compensation, whew, wrong place. Yeah. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, one thing I want to point out for people who find wrongdoing, um, <clears throat> I just love this reward program that's part of Dodd-Frank with the SEC's Office of the Whistleblower, because really 10 to 30 percent of SEC fines now go towards whistleblowers. And that has attracted legal talent to the cause of the whistleblower. Mm -hmm. So someone runs across a problem, they can actually, you know, just Google whistleblower legal help, and they'll find some law firms that can give them some great advice, mm -hmm. help steer the course, you know, help map a plan for them. And sometimes maybe they haven't found something wrong and they'll be able to bounce ideas up from off this, these lawyers to determine, okay, maybe I haven't found anything. 
But the beauty of it too is, you know, I, I first stumbled across very aggressive accounting at Enron in late 96. And what, what Enron adopted as fair value accounting in 96 was really the seeds of the later fraud. Mm -hmm. And I did speak to some Arthur Anderson colleagues. I got in trouble. I spoke internally that I was against this. You know, I would have contacted a lawyer. They would have contacted the SEC. The SEC would have come in, slapped Enron on the wrist, you know, fined them. Enron would have stayed on a straighter, straight and narrow path. And I want to point out that I wouldn't be thinking, wow, I saved Enron from bankruptcy. And the SEC wouldn't be thinking, we saved shareholders from losing $60 billion. Right. You know, so we need to be respectful that the small things that get stopped are really perhaps preventing a huge problem. And I think that's one of the main problems with ethics, compliance, risk management departments. They don't get credit for the huge problems they've prevented. That's great, Sharon. I'm so glad you brought that up because that concept that it's hard to value or you just can't value the thing that you pre prevented um, is really a big struggle that I think we have in ethics departments and in this profession of we're doing great work all the time. Right. We're, you know, we're preventing fires. We're, you know, there's there's a lot that we've discussed on the show about the cost that you bore as a whistleblower, but the cost of this fraud, yeah. you know, what was it? 5,000 people having to go look for new jobs, moving their families around, not making income, you know, all of the shareholder loss right. there. That's the real thing that, you know, we're working all the time to prevent and it's so hard to 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 really say, hey, you know what, if I hadn't done this, then three years from now, there would be a $50 million fine. But we have to get into a place where we can advocate to our board, our leadership, to our finance departments around this is important and this is what's going to keep us from um, that big problem down the line. Right. And just as we wrap up, Sharon, I appreciate you bringing up that that difficulty in valuing what you prevent. Um, and I just, I just want to say that for all the costs that you've borne, for all of the time that you've spent, not on your normal career path, you know, kind of dealing with all of the challenges, that, challenges that come, you've been an inspiration to me. I know that when I saw this happening, I was like, wow, I can't imagine what that would be like to go up against that Goliath and say, totally. Hey, you know what, this is the right thing. And I'm going to say the right thing, you know, and deal with the consequences. I think a lot of times we talk about how, you know, whistleblowers, you know, have this reputation and, you know, you know, how should we deal with it? There are a lot of people and, you know, it may not be the CEOs of all the companies. There are a lot of people that see what you did and said, you know what, I want to be like that. And I want to be someone who stands for what's right. And, I, you know, I just I, I really appreciate you modeling and living out those values so the rest of us can see, hey, you know what, it can be done. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's very uh, kind words. Warms my heart. I appreciate it. Um, where can people find you? Um, where can they find your book? Where can they sneak? Where Where are you giving classes? Where can we sneak in and yeah, uh, steal a, a lecture here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. Uh, I am going to be doing some. Obviously, I'm full time at Texas State and San Marcos, Texas. But I do teach a weekend course at UNC up the road from you guys oh, wow. at Chapel Hill. I did it last February, and I'll be doing it this coming February. Those for that's for MBA students at uh, Keenan Flagler there oh, at cool. USC. Awesome. Very cool. Um, and so I'm, uh, you know, I think these podcast opportunities are wonderful as well. So I, I'm, um, I, I like the idea of getting, getting the word out about what, you know, to would be whistleblowers. Yeah. There's so much magic that can come from digesting the fact that reality is our friend and empowering people and giving them a voice to be these human sensors in our organization. Only then can we truly start to crowdsource risk management. This is not a game of sweeping more dirt underneath a rug and hoping that, you know, it doesn't feel too lumpy as we're walking across it. It's about <laughs> having a clean floor. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, exactly. So anyways, uh, until next time, thank you guys for joining us.